is a very hectic schedule. For those that do not know the board, Dr. Forgash, it's, he's at the University of Missouri where he has an endowed chair in biophysics. And physics. And physics. Mm -hmm. Stuff that approaches rocket science, so I don't go that direction. But he also does a lot on the biological side. And he's been one of the, one of the first uh, individuals I've known to try to bring together the physical sciences and the biological sciences together. And we had the opportunity to, uh, to work with him in a, in a project that Gabor developed uh, uh, now six, six years or so ago, a grant to NSF at BioPrending, a, a Frontiers of Biological Research, a fiber grant, that I think really helped <coughs> the catabolic field uh, for has made advances in, the, in this area that are, I think, important for us. We're struggling with certain aspects of BioPrending in our own NSF program. I was, was asked Gabriel if he would come and visit with us, see where we are. He's the, uh, the uh, science director at uh, two companies that are involved a lot with tissue engineering, Organova. And the other one is called Modern, Modern Meadow. Modern Meadows. I'll let you ruminate on, on that one a bit. Yeah. But it's a pleasure to have him here. He's going to share with us uh, a seminar that I, that I hope will uh, launch a good discussion. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, they'll launch a discussion this afternoon in the scientific working group meeting. If there's anybody that's come here from other institutions, I think some of you have. I appreciate you driving down and being a part uh, today of the science working group meeting. I think we'll have a, an interesting couple hours this afternoon. And right after this meeting is over, or the seminar is over, there's a lunch will be served uh, down at the other conference room in the CRI. And looking at the size of the group here, there's enough food for everybody there. Even if you're don't want to go to the working group meeting, go ahead and eat something. Chris has promised not to go until everybody's done, so we'll make sure we have enough left. The rest of you can uh, can stay, and we'll, I think we'll have some interesting things to discuss this, this afternoon. And uh, I guess then without uh, further ado, uh, Professor Forgash, tell us uh, where where your printing is headed. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roger. It, it really is a pleasure back. I, I, I know this room very well. In the course of the five-year collaboration that we had, uh, we had numerous meetings here, discussions, so it feels good to be back uh, here. I understand that this talk also serves the purpose of being a prelude to the discussion that we're going to have uh, in the afternoon about, about the export grants. And so, uh, I, I, I will have, I, I have here about 137 slides now, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> to, to select what, what is needed. Uh, it, it, it does serve that purpose uh, that I just mentioned, but it also tries to give a, a, a more complete picture of what we are doing, where we are heading, and uh, uh, where organ printing is heading. Actually, I don't like this term, organ printing because it's misleading. It should have been there, uh, bioprinting, but given the history here, I did put organ printing, but I try to avoid this term. So I presume that not everybody is a tissue engineer in this room. I will give a two-minute introduction to, intro to, to uh, tissue engineering. And uh, the story always starts by motivating your work and in this case, it is uh, the usual stuff that there are so many people waiting for donor organs uh, that we simply cannot supply. Nobody can supply those donor organs, so something has to be done. And uh, what are the methods that we try to mitigate this problem? Of course, the gold standard is finding the matching donors. That's very difficult. Uh, today, uh, we're using, for some purposes, we're using cadavers, uh, for other than just collecting their organs. Xenotransplantation is, is, uh, is, is coming. Artificial organs, none of them is ideal other than, uh, well, even the matching organs, uh, donors are not, is not a bit ideal. So uh, the new field of tissue engineering is the one that everybody hopes that is going to be the panacea for all the bad things that uh, 
haunt us in this field. And tissue engineering, when I say it's a new discipline, it is relatively new. It, it goes back, I mean, it started in earnest, being popular in the middle of the 90s. And um, uh, it's due mostly to uh, Langer and the group that, that he created at, um, at MIT. So it's about a 20, close to 20 year old uh, discipline. And um, it has already accomplished fantastic things, but it's still in its infancy. And, and, and even though 20 years perhaps is not infancy, but, but it is a very difficult problem to come up with new organs and tissues. So uh, it is an interdisciplinary science. That's the nice thing about it. It involves engineers, chemists, physicists, even mathematicians. So there's place for everybody. In this, in this area. And uh, the whole story started with something that is called scaffold-based tissue engineering. And even today, tissue engineering is fundamentally or mostly scaffold-based. What does that mean? That means that you take some kind of polymer, whether it's an it's a, it's a artificial polymer or a natural polymer, all kinds of fancy names are listed there, uh, and uh, you put the cells into this polymer network uh, to mimic the extracellular matrix. That's really the, the aim. And you put uh, the, your cells into this network and you pray to God that they proliferate and eventually you will have so many that you just harvest them or you just use the whole structure as it is, being a biodegradable ma matrix, uh, you have a tissue. Well, that, that's, the, that's the hope. And uh, even though this approach has uh, reached, accomplished some fantastic things, there are tangible results, uh, it has problems. It has been applied to generate all kinds of tissues, everything you can imagine. But it does have problems, and some of the problems is that uh, it is still a fundamentally trial and error <coughs> approach, even though some people will not agree with me. For me, it's a trial and, and, and um, uh, error approach because I also come from developmental biology. And I know that there are close to around 200 different tissue types in, in a human body, and each of them produces its tissue cell-specific extracellular matrix, and I have no clue how we're ever going to mimic uh, that complexity in the lab. But some people will say, yeah, we're, we're, doing, we're doing well, okay, and, and, and okay. I wish them luck. Um, especially if, if you deal with, with mixtures of cells, and tissues are mixtures of cells, mm -hmm. then this is even more complicated because uh, some people will argue that, no, I, I came up with a, with a scaffold which is ideal to deal with um, osteocytes or osteoblasts or, or, or smooth muscle cells or whatever. Uh, but, but what if I throw into the smooth muscle cell soup endothelial cells or fibroblasts? I have no clue how to modify that, uh, that scaffold. Uh, you start with a relatively low density of cells and even when you grow them up, the density is still not going to be uh, uh, equivalent or similar even to what you expect, to what you have in a solid organ. Uh, the other big problem is that uh, those scaffolds may not be fully biodegradable. And even if they are, there is a competition between the degradation of that scaffold and, and, uh, and the building up the natural extracellular matrix that the cells secrete. And there are demonstrated uh, consequences of this mismatch. Shaping the scaffold so that you can get the desired shape of the organ structure or the, or the tissue structure that you, you want is not that trivial. In simple cases it is. And when I say simple cases, uh, the celebrated examples are uh, a neo bladder that, that, um, that was engineered by, by Atala and the people around him 
uh, and, and that organ structure has been implanted with some success in the patients. And that's, a, that's basically a balloon. So you can shape a two-dimensional scaffold, because it is a two-dimensional structure, mostly, and, and populate the surface of that scaffold with the cells. Or even if it is not, if it is even, even if it is a, is a solid sphere, it is the surface that, that, that counts. So you can, you can put cells on that surface, and, and you have a shape. But typically, it's not a surface that you have to, you have to build. Or the, the, the trachea, uh, the windpipe, that was uh, engineered by uh, uh, a Spanish doctor, Machiaridi, and, and, and people around him. And this is a celebrated example also, was put into a patient uh, who had severe problems with, with breathing, and now apparently is a happy camper. So there are uh, spectacular accomplishments, but uh, those are, I would say, more the, 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 the exception than the rule. So, come on. Good. This animation is something that many people some people in this room know. Uh, it, it was created actually here. And uh, this was an early example where we tried to show how we want to build a tubular construct. And so the little balls that are descending there are what we call uh, bioing particles. And those are typically spherical aggregates of cells. And they are put in some supporting environment that you can call the biopaper. And then uh, you deposit them with a, with a fancy machine, with a fancy printer, a special purpose uh, delivery device that knows how to handle biological material. And then you deposit them, and then something spectacular happens, those aggregates fuse. And fusion is a fundamental morphogenetic process. Cells, uh, tissue constructs, tissue fragments know how to do that. And in embryonic development, uh, it is, it is, it is, it is used to, to build, for the embryo to build organs, and this is what is being mimicked in this, um, in this technology. So we've used this technology to build uh, structures, which I'm going to show you. Uh, uh, you see two micropipettes. One of them is filled with spherical aggregates, and the other one, you can't really discern, it's, a, it's just a, a lump of cells. It's a, a, a solid structure, a sausage, essentially, that resides in the micropipette. And those are the, the, uh, the printed cartridges. And you put them into the, the various uh, bioprinters, and you deposit them either as individual aggregates or in a continuous way if you, if you use the, the sausage. Uh, I'm going to show you in a moment how it is done in, in, in practice. So this is the bioprinter that Organovo designed and built. Uh, this is the one that we use at the company right now. Um, the, here are various other bioprinters that are creating structures. And uh, the peculiarity <coughs> of, the, of, the, of the approach, at least as I showed in the previous slide, uh, that this biopaper into which we are putting these aggregates is also being printed. And in this particular case, it's a collagen sheet. And then you start putting the aggregates into the collagen sheet, and you see the first layer of that structure that was animated on the previous slide. And then here you saw uh, from proximity how the individual aggregates are coming out. Now, on the other hand, uh, when you looked at the printer, the printer was doing something horizontally, depositing a line of cellular material horizontally. Whereas here, we're trying to build something, or try to build something vertically. The best that we could do in this vertical construction is something like this. Three layers on top of each other. We never, we were never able to build more. So uh, this came up with the discussion with, uh, with Roger, can one build a cellular uh, tube uh, going vertically? Now, we were not able to do that, and uh, the difficulties were enormous, at least without any supporting structure. If you use a supporting structure like a, a, a double uh, cylindrical uh, little pipe, 
and you put the cells in between the two walls, you will be able to do something. But at that time, we, we didn't want to go to the excruciating details. So we came up with a different way, and that was already elucidated uh, by showing the printer going horizontally. And the way we built our tubular structures today is shown here schematically. And, and this is probably the most one of the most important slides for, for the discussion that we're going to have in the afternoon. Uh, we start with a supporting material. You, have, you, you see two kinds of, of, of uh, uh, one-dimensional structures here. This, uh, this stuff is a, is, a, is, a, is a support material in, in most of the cases that we use. It's, it's a hydrogel. We use agarose. Mostly. There are, there are other fancier ones, but for the purposes of this discussion, agarose is going to be good. Agarose is a material that cells hate. They do not penetrate. They don't invade. They don't stick to it. And it has, uh, it, it is very, very significant that, that it's neutral, cell neutral. So in the f we deposit the first layer. So it goes layer by layer. It's additive uh, manufacturing. Here is the first layer. Then comes the second layer. In the second layer, we're building this, this a tube that is uh, made of six lines of, of cellular material, and we are depositing the first two sequence. In this case, those are aggregates. But here, those are the cylinders that I alluded to. Printing individual aggregates, it's pain. Uh, but it's doable. So here is then the, the, the template. It shows how we build this stuff. It is surrounded by the support material that is agarose. Then happens the magic. The cellular material fuses. And uh, eventually, once it's fused, uh, agarose being cell neutral, you can just remove it easily. Uh, even the one in the middle, you just pinch to it and you pull it out. And the same thing can be accomplished by, by doing the cylinders. And uh, this is much more practical. But the point, the, the message I want to convey here is that we're not building the tube vertically. We are building the tube itself horizontally, although layer by layer. And when we got, when we, when we realized that we can build tubes this way, uh, things became order of magnitude simpler and the resulting products much, 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 much nicer. But the cell thickness was three cells only. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just first show this because this is important and then the animation is gone. So uh, here we build, this, you see in reality what is going on. Uh, the first layer was deposited. Now the first two cellular layer, cellular cylinders, this is cylindrical printing, and so we are continuing. And eventually we end up with that, that die. And here you see the aggregates, at least in, in, um, in schematically, and then the fusion takes place. I'm sorry, so what was the question? Uh, just the question was that no matter how you build it, <coughs> the thickness of the tissue is three cells. Three cells? Why is three cells? That's what you said. You said in a vertical direction, you can build only three cells. No, three no. spheroids. What I, what I said no spheroids, is yeah. that uh, in the ver when we built it vertically, we were not able to build more than three uh, rings of cells, each ring being made of aggregates. Uh -huh. yes. But we were not able to build more. Here, I can build a, a I tube. Uh, I can build a tube of uh, whatever, right. five meters. So once uh, the fusion has taken place, uh, the stuff is put into a bioreactor. I don't know if, if, uh, if, if that animation worked, but it's a bioreactor, which is a perfusion bioreactor. Uh, we cannulate uh, to it the, the, the tube, and we start perfusioning, and, and this is when the, the tube starts maturing. Uh, what do I mean by maturing? Since we started with pure cellular material uh, without any extracellular matrix because this is purely biological. There's no scaffold here, at least not any artificial scaffold. This guy here is not a scaffold. It's a support. That's a big difference, uh, which means a scaffold is typically something into which you put cells. We are not putting the cells anywhere. 
the, the thing when you showed that movie, those things that you're calling the cell sausage, yeah. there seemed to be something in that that gave it some sort of, it's not just cells, just, is it? It is just cells. And At that it, point, it's just in cells. What? Hmm? In what, though? Cells in media? That wouldn't no, know. It's not cells in media. What happens when you take a petri dish, right. uh, you grow the cells, you centrifuge the hell out of them, you have something that is a clump of cells. This is a clump of cells. Pellet, yeah. It's a pellet. Okay, it's almost so it's like a, a pellet. It's a continuous pellet. It's a continuous pellet. But when you put it and you confine it then in between the agarose, then yes. that's what's keeping them exactly. in position. Transition, and uh, transiently. Yeah. And the ends would leak. <laughs> I mean, the ends would leak. Yeah. Well, well, you'd hope so. You, the you ends, mean, the stuff would kind of drip out of, right? You mean the cells? Leak. Yeah. No, they no. don't. They don't. Well, anything is leaking here. This is reality that I showed you. It's 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 mechanically okay. uh, enough it's, it's enough. Uh, uh, the mechanical integrity is sufficient to keep it together. It is still a lump of cells. Okay. And so a lump, uh, 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 the uh, pellet will not dissociate uh, uh, until but the there is some sort of media too. Well, <coughs> all this is in media, of oh. course, of course. This all this thing is in media, uh, okay. but this is solid cellular material. Okay. Well, that's a lot of cells. Oh, a lot, a of, lot cells. of cells. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that, that of course, is, yeah. is going to raise the question: yeah. Where do you get the, the tons of cells? But that's yeah, yeah. that's a separate question. Okay, so what does it mean maturing the construct? Uh, it doesn't have um, extracellular matrix at that point, so it's mechanical integrity. It's, it's very weak. Uh, you have to uh, carry it very carefully, but you can do that. Uh, it is so weak that when, when we want to build a vascular construct uh, that eventually has to be a blood vessel and withstand uh, uh, several thousands of millimeters of mercury, uh, in the body, uh, this one cannot do that. In fact, uh, when typically when we put it in at uh, just after the fusion so that we can handle it, uh, its burst pressure, this is the pressure at which it would burst, uh, that is provided by this uh, perfusion flow, and it's, it's maybe 10 millimeters of mercury, which is nothing. However, in 2021, about three weeks, it reaches a burst pressure of over 1,000 millimeters of mercury, which is fantastic. So something is going on, something magical is going on here during this maturation process. And what is going on is, uh, uh, typically, is that, that the cells start secreting their own extracellular matrix, their own extracellular matrix. So if this is made, let's say, the first approximation only of smooth muscle cells, then they secrete the smooth muscle cell Typical extracellular matrix uh, that is that is that is the one uh, that 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 smooth muscle co uh, tissue constructs made of smooth muscle cells have. So it's not it, there's nothing artificial here. Yeah. Um, what type of cells are these? Are they just endothelial cells or? Well, cells? as I just said, the first approximation when we make a tubular construct, we make it from smooth muscle cells. Now. If we want to make it uh, more relevant to uh, vascular biology, then typically we mix endothelial cells into this sausage or the ag aggregates, and I will show you, and then something else magical happens, and the cells find their physiologically correct positions. So printing this stuff, and this has to be emphasized, it's nothing, it's a stupid exercise. Once I have a good printer, once I have my binding particles, this is a, you don't need to, a brain, you only need practice. What happens afterwards is the magic. But there I don't participate. Uh, cells do it. Nature knows what to do. That binding particles fuse, um, the cells find their physiologically correct position. I don't have control over that process. Beyond providing near physiological conditions to the construct that I want to reach. Now, this is not a heart. This is not a lung. At this point, this is just a little organ structure being a tube. Now, you are 70% made of tubes, so tubes are very important. 
but it's not a liver. And anybody who tells you that can print a liver is lying or a kidney. I'm not even pretending that I can do anything like that today. Okay, final product. After about a month, here is a vessel that you can take and uh, in, in implant into an animal. And that's, with this one, it's, it's going on right now. Some of them have already, has already been put into rats, and um, the rats didn't die because of, of this guy. Uh, they eventually died because we killed them. We, we were going to harvest the, the structure. But as long as they are there, they function pretty well. I'm not saying that everything is perfect, but others are doing this, and there, uh, there is another company doing it very differently, and they have already implanted such, uh, such tubes into, into humans. So it's coming. Are they sutured to exist in blood vessels? Yes. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, the other, uh, let me backtrack. So when I think that this is a, is a, is a good construct, I, I measure the biomechanical properties, uh, burst pressure, uh, contractility, um, um, suture retention strength. Then I go to the surgeon and I tell him, here's a blood vessel, can you use it? And lo and behold, the three questions that he's going to ask me, what is the burst pressure, what is the suture retention strength, and what is contractility? And he's not going to ask me, what is the genetic profile of the structure? He couldn't care less. If it is a big, bigger artery or bigger blood vessel, you can bring a plastic pipe to the surgeon and he will put it in there. So a surgeon is not us. I hope there are no surgeons here. Uh, they, they are practical people. They are asking different questions. His goal or her goal is to save the life of the patient. Your goal is to find out what's the genetic profile of the cell that I am working with. Very different questions. So this is what he's going to ask. So if the suture retention strength is fine, then he can put it in and suture it or use some surgical glue, which is more de delicate, but, but less uh, um, uh, critical when, when you want to connect it with the rest of the, of the circuitry system. I think at this point we are the only ones in the world who can make uh, branching vessels. And there are some examples of that, and these are older ones. We can make better ones today. So that's, that's uh, the technology in a nutshell. Okay, Carl, and I, can, I, can I just ask you about Yeah. <clears throat> so um, when you put two tubes together, one is going to end on the blind point on one of the other vessels or closed. Well, don't forget that we're printing everything. So I can print aggregates in any way I want. And so the way it is done, uh, you're depositing according to that scheme. Well, that, that applies to a, well, in fact, no, I, I think I show even the template. Go back. So if I want to build a branching vessel, then I use a template like that. Is, is that? Does that answer oh, okay. your question? I was imagining you're putting two no. tubes together. No, no, no. I'm printing continuously. Yeah. How thick is the diameter of these tubes? Well, that, that depends what you want to build. Uh, here, <coughs> just go. It depends on the on the diameter of your aggregates or the the tubes, uh, the cellular tubes. This one has an inner diameter uh, about 500 microns, no, one millimeter, and this one has an inner diameter of 500 microns. In relation to that, what's the lower limit? Uh, that depends on the diameter of our bio ink particle, and uh, at this point, the limit is about 120 microns. So uh, imagine that then the wall, if I only make one one sequence of the spiny particles and the wall is 120 microns and uh, in this case it, the, the, the lumen would be 120 microns but you can and again I think I, I showed here examples of uh, more complex bigger bigger lumina uh, structures so here the lumen those are 500 microns 
when the lumen is roughly one millimeter. Is the ratio always 10 to 1 between the thickness of the wall and the diameter of the vessel? Absolutely not. Why would that be 10 to 1? In this case, if you this said is 100 micron and about. Now, well, let's say this is 500 microns. Here is an aggregate with the diameter of 100, uh, 500 microns. This lumen, when it finally <laughs> forms, is roughly one millimeter. So the ratio is one to two, two to one. No, no, no. You, you, uh, uh, there's no, there's no correlation between between the diameter of the inner diameter of the tube and the and the, and the diameter of your binding particles. You have no, all I was, the freedom. I was thinking about the oxygen requirement for that tube, right? Now that's a different question. You're asking the same how question big related to how thick it is that wall. Right, that's true. Uh, but I, I, I'm sorry, I thought you, you're asking uh, the ratio between the wall and the inner diameter. Now, there is no correlation. But you're absolutely right. Uh, there, is, there is limitation on how big those aggregates can be because uh, there is diffusional uh, limit for the penetration of nutrients. If I could vascularize them, that would be a different story. But, but those are not vascularized, vascularized at this point. So we found that the way we make the aggregates, and I think we're the world champions in making the aggregates, uh, we can go to 500 microns, and we're still OK. We have 98% of the cells within the aggregate are, are alive after one week, two weeks. Uh, but you cannot go, we cannot go beyond, uh, at least not when we construct a structure like that. 500 microns is the maximum and because of the reason that you, you just pointed out. If I could just interject one, perhaps one relevant point, was at a recent, uh, at a meeting last week, uh, or I guess it was last month, for this particular data, Jay Potts showed using like, uh, yield, what they, like yield collagen tubes. This is a tube that seeded the cells, and they implanted it surgically. And I was amazed, uh, what Jay showed was that when that tube is implanted, which are thicker than these are, those tubes got vascularized by the surrounding parenchyma. They're just, I don't sure where these blood vessels came from. Obviously, they, they created an angiogenic or vasculogenic stimulus in the tissue in which they were implanted, and the tubes became vascularized. So that, again, a, a lot of, like, like the was saying, nature finds a way to do a lot of things that we can't figure out and just be mimetic with it, not inhibitory to, to those processes. The body is the best bioreactor, for sure. And indeed, uh, very often what, what happens is that we, we take what we can make and then we put it implanted um, and then something much better happens um, because the body is able to do things that we, we cannot. But I will come back to vascularization later. So we have seen this, we have seen this. And now let me show you a few applications. Uh, the blood vessel, uh, I already alluded to it, uh, uh, but, but the structures that I showed you were not yet blood vessels because they were made of, of, of smooth muscle cells. But I also mentioned that uh, we, can, we can take our uh, bio-ink and uh, produce it as a mixture of cells. And what we have done uh, here, well, this is a little bit misleading because it shows green, green rods and red rods and, it, uh, and in, in reality, what happens is that we took just one kind of rod, but those were made of a mixture of cells, smooth muscle cells, and endothelial cells. And here is the end result of that exercise. So we make this, this tube. We see the cross-section of that tube. The green cells are smooth muscle cells, and the red cells are endothelial cells. And the way it came about, during those maturation, it's not only that the fusion that takes place, but also miraculously, at least for me, even though I know what cell sorting is, but in this context, I've never seen it before. So the cells, which are randomly distributed, we still see some red guys there, uh, but predominantly, upon perfusion, the endothelial cells migrated to the inner lumen. Why? Possibly because they are genetically engineered by nature in such a way that they can sense flow. So I am an endothelial cell. I am somewhere in this, in this mixture. But I say, oh, I think there is somewhere flow, because there is perfusion. 
I have to be close to, 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 to the flow. That's my job. And so it migrates to the lumen. Now, this is not perfect. The reason is that uh, uh, the flow is good, but at the same time, it's also bad. Because depending on, on, on how strong that flow is, beyond a critical shear stress, it just rips the endothelial cells of the wall. Why would you say that versus differential adhesion? You, you are Malcolm Steinberg's student. I mean, why wouldn't they sort just like they sort? I tell you why. Why? Because what I learned from Malcolm Steinberg, that if I take a sphere, yes. a random mixture of cells in a sphere, then there will be sorting. This is not a sphere. Yeah, but the sphere is cells. OK. Later, I show you what the okay. difference is. All right. Uh, it is All highly right. non-trivial. That at least for me, it wasn't, because a, a cylinder is not is not a, an is, is not a sphere. There's a big difference between the geometry. But I, for that, I have to draw something. So I'll, I'll show okay. you later. Okay. But in any way, good. It does happen. Uh, so what I was saying that it's not perfect because unfortunately the flow also can rip the endothelial cells. You have to realize that. Uh, for the endothelial cells go to the lumen, attach, which is the intima eventually that is going to, to, to form. Uh, that's, the, that's the intima, the inner part. Yes? Is there any contribution that you know about in terms of cell survival in the different sort of uh, parts of the, the, uh, the, the that could contribute to this? Um, possibly. Possibly. Uh, but the endothelial cell just doesn't like to be it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Are you putting serum in that? Is that what's flowing through? The serum? Uh, actually, most of the time there is no serum. What, what kind of? It's DMEM. It's a very simple uh, medium that we, where we, we grow ourselves. There's nothing fancy in the medium. There's no serum or growth there? We only need the, the basic nutrients. We don't. We don't want to proliferate ourselves at this point, so we don't. We don't. We don't put serum. It's expensive and expensive anyway. No, at that point we don't need. We you really don't. Oh, well, we could, but but most of the time we don't. We don't. At this stage we don't put serum in there. So it's 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 just to get the the, the nutrients and even even that is not the issue. The issue is to to provide, mimic uh, the perfusion, the blood blood flow. Uh, the, uh, the juice is really in in the outside in the bioreactor, not in the in the tube itself. Now, cell death, yeah, that that does occur. And at the beginning, mostly when we didn't have endothelial cells, that's very interesting. Um, the, the 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 tube got clogged. And eventually, there was cell death, uh, uh, quite, quite substantial, that substantive uh, cell death. In the presence of endothelial cells, it, it didn't occur. So there's, there's all kinds of magic things happening that a priori we would have never figured out theoretically. You have to do this, and, and then you're amazed uh, what kind of tricks nature can, can do. Does so, pulsatile flow help you? Oh yeah, that's what I was saying. That pulsatile flow helped enormously. Uh, laminar flow without pulse, that's not good. There will be partial sorting, but it will never be as good as this. Yes, you, you are mimicking the real situation, the physiological situation, and helps uh, and, and it sells like that. So this shows the, the perfusion system and the bioreactor system inside the, an incubator. It's pretty complex, but it's, it, it's not as complex as it might, might, might seem, but you have to provide the right conditions. Here is uh, the cannulated vessels, uh, um, the bioreactor again, and here you see the maturing construct under the pulsatile flow. This is this vessel being perfused and maturing. And, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the variation on the flow parameters is very important. You start with a very weak flow, obviously, because you don't want to rip your, your tube, but then you change the flow condition as the system matures. And that, that is, uh, there, there are no set rules for that. You, you, you experiment with that to find the right condition. So as I said, today, 
in about three weeks, three to four weeks, we can get to the point uh, that we can come up with a segment that, that is implantable. And interestingly enough, the other company that is making such, uh, such tubes uh, um, uh, for implantation, the name of the company is Cytograph, it takes them as well about three, three to four weeks. So there is something that is dictated by biology. Cytograph okay. is Todd McKellinger's company. Yeah. And they're, they're mostly, you're, you're doing the more challenging one of smaller vessels. He, mm -hmm. Todd usually does larger vessels. No, not much larger. It's the, always the intermediate size vessel, anything between three to six millimeters in diameter. Right. That's, but yeah, Todd, they are making. What he showed me is a much larger. I think yours is, well, he may be. I, 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 thought, I, think you're, I think you're ahead of it. Of well, we are making it differently. Um, one difference is is that, well, first of all, they, 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 their initial construct is made of fibroblasts exclusively. They then endothelialize it differently. They have the endothelial cells in the flow, and the, the endothelial cells from the flow just got stuck on, on the wall of this fibroblastic structure. So that's one difference. Um, they, they, they grow, they entice the cells to make extracellular matrix again differently than, than us. Uh, they can make linear segments. We can make branching segments. But I, you may be right. I, I, my recollection is that uh, their vessels have more or less the same diameter than ours. Because much bigger ones you don't, you don't need, because you can use any pipe. Much smaller ones you cannot build anyway, and it's not necessary because the body will um, uh, uh, microvascularize your structure. And it is this intermediate structure with the in, uh, inner diameter of between two to six millimeters is the critical. Well, I think that is, but Todd does not, what he's doing in clinical trials in other countries. Yes. They're bigger than the year one. Okay. He would, he's wanting to push us to make bigger vessels, I think. But why, you why, would, you make, the, why would you want to make uh, vessels with a centimeter of the order of centimeter diameter? You can use uh, the daffron, you can use anything. Well, uh, I agree. Okay. Well, that's their choice. So, this is uh, the vascular structures. Now, look carefully what. This is moving. There's contractility here. So you have to watch carefully. This thing, is, the whole thing is moving. Now, now that I showed you that it's moving, I tell you what it is. So in the upper right corner, you see a, a discrete structure. Uh, I, I put it back. Everybody saw that it was contracting? Fine. No. No? <laughs> Good guess. Well, because Maybe you have glasses. glasses. Well, I believe you. <laughs> for, for you, I'll show separately. You. <laughs> you know this joke. You, you, you know this joke. Uh, you have to know that French and, and Belg Belgian people, the French think not very high of the Belgians. And so there's this train somewhere in, in France, and in the compartment there are eight people, and uh, uh, there's one guy who says, uh, Madame et Monsieur, I'm going to tell you a Belgian joke. Well, French talking, telling jokes about the Belgians. Oh, and one says, but Monsieur, I am Belge. He said, oh, you are? For you, I'll repeat. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I didn't want to be as drastic. <laughs> so there are 36 discrete aggregates there, 500 microns each. They fuse. And that's the structure that you see uh, on the right. And that little white corner is what you see here. It's at the boundary. Uh, this whole thing is in collagen. Uh, and, and, and so the whitish is the cellular material, which is the blackish here. No, sorry, the blackish. And then the, and this one is what is black there. So this is the collagen, and this is cardiomyocytes. So those are embryonic chick cardiomyocytes. They say, yeah, well, they are all pacemaker cells, so they, they contract. That's true, but not in unison. 
are in the body, yes. But, but when I take this uh, poor chick embryo and massacre it, and I take the, cardio, the, the heart and I dissociate the embryonic heart into individual cells, and then I rebuild or build this tissue construct, there's no guarantee that after so many manipulations, those cells will contract synchronously. It takes about four days to repair itself, so to, to secrete uh, uh, troponin and, and, and establish the gap junctions through which uh, the, the communication, the electric signaling, and, and the, eventually the, the uniform beating can be reestablished. So I was, after 90 hours, it started beating, but not before. And here is the beating in time. And the, even the amplitudes are comparable, comparable to what the chick embryo is producing. So here is an example of uh, this bioprinting technology and whatever is surrounds it, uh, the, the, the <clears throat> preparation of the bioing, the fusion, and what else happens during this process of maturation, that functionality is retained. So I take this patch now, I create an infarct <coughs> and, um, and the chick uh, uh, heart, and then I glue this patch there, and I repair that diseased muscle, or part of the muscle. And that, that was demonstrated, it takes over the function. Yes? Did you uh, condition those uh, contracts with any bioreactors? When you say condition, what do you mean? Yes. You know, you oh, I matured. Yeah. Well, this one, this is not a blood vessel, so uh, the conditioning only meant that I, I, I put this sheet on a Petri dish and I attached it to Velcro so that if it wanted to beat, there was some mechanical conditioning, but it didn't beat until, until 90 hours after, after plating. So in that sense, I conditioned. Okay, so this is a patch. Now this is something that we started about two years ago, uh, making nerve grafts. Now, nerve uh, injury uh, is unfortunately a, a rather frequent injury, especially in the battlefield. DARPA gives a lot of money for this kind of research. Uh, in traffic accidents, you can have a nerve caught. And so repairing such a nerve injury uh, is a challenge. Now, a nerve bundle typically has this geometry. Uh, so it's a tube as well, except that it's, the geometry is more complex than that of the blood vessel. There are tubes within tubes. So those little things here are little tubes in which the axons are running uh, with their own myelin layer made of Schwann cells and so that's why I said there are tubes within the tubes. Now we wanted to build something like that. Why? Because if a nerve is caught, then there is the proximal part of the nerve that is still attached to the cell body, and there is the distal one uh, that is the one that innervates uh, the muscle, and there, is th there will be a gap between the two. If you do not bridge that gap in due time, then this distal part will die. This, this one, the proximal, still will be there, but you will never innervate the, the, the muscle that you want to innervate. So you need to bridge this gap. So you, you, you want to make a nerve graft as opposed to a vascular graft. So we used the same technology, but, but, but adapted it to this geometry, and we built something that you see there. Uh, that's why we have three holes there. So it's a tube with three empty channels at that point, empty channels, and the difference, uh, and, the, and the only thing is that, that uh, the lumen of that empty channel is populated with Schwann cells. All this is red cells. And we took this piece and we inserted it into a rat. And there is the gross uh, surgery that is going on. So this is a one centimeter piece of a nerve graft. Uh, we, we, the surgeons, created a one, roughly one centimeter cut in the sciatic nerve, one of the sciatic nerves of the rat, and they implanted the structure. And then we started praying to God that eventually it is integrated and the poor bastard will eventually move its leg. Now this never happened. 
So you say, oh, so then it's junk. No, it's not junk. In fact, nerve regeneration did take place. However, if you do not train a rat, it's a smart animal, uh, it will never use the repaired, the repaired uh, leg because it learns how to live with three. Now, in order to, to regenerate this also as far as the muscular, um, uh, the, the, the muscle movement is, is concerned, you have to train the rats. So we, we didn't do that. But what we did, we excised a piece of the sciatic nerve, repaired this way, and we performed electrophysiological studies. We also counted the number of axons that went through this gap, this, this, this bridging graph, and then counted how many arrived into the distal part. So electrophysiology, they put two electrodes and two ends uh, in, the, in the distal end and in the proximal end so that you, get, you, you, you push current through the, uh, the, 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 uh, the graft, and it was amazing. It, it was uh, about 80% of what you could measure on the control the control being, um, well, control here means also um, uh, repair, but with the gold standard. And for us, the gold standard was that we cut uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other legs, uh, the, the sciatic nerve, the other leg, we cut out the piece, and we inverted it, and we put it back. But it's still an autologous graft. And of course, that is the, the gold standard. So if you have an injury, and that injury is not bigger, the gap is not bigger than three centimeters in a human, then there is a good chance for spontaneous regeneration. If the gap is bigger than three, three centimeters, it will never happen. So in that case, the surgeon goes and excises another piece of, of, of nerve from somewhere that is less critical. What do I mean by less critical? So if you have a motor nerve that is injured, uh, that's bad. So, so you, you really want to repair it. But you can take a sensory nerve, cut out, for example, from your hand, and use that as a graft. Well, okay, big deal. I, I, I won't feel anything here, but I still will be able to move my, 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 my hand. So put a, that's the first approximation. Put a sensory nerve in view of a, of a, of a motor nerve. Well, that's not a perfect thing, but, but it's pretty good. It, but it's still yours. Now. I, there's always associated risk. It's, uh, there is a secondary surgery, morbidity, blah, blah, blah. It's always there. So it's much better if you, if you make something out of your own cells like this, you put it in, and you hope that it's going to work. So it, it was up to, I think it was between 80 and 85% uh, similar to the, to the gold standard, which, which I think is, is, is wonderful. So this is another application, and um, so from now on, and I don't know how much I should go into that, it's the underlying science. What is going on here? Um, why do they fuse? Why do they sort? So this is more biophysics, and that the, 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 the terminology here is tissue liquidity, right? Anything that fuses, it's like liquids fuse. Anything like sorting, cell sorting is analogous to um, to two immiscible liquids separating from each other. And maybe I, I won't go much into that, i just go quickly through it, uh, because this is not going to fundamentally affect what we're going to talk in the afternoon. And for those of you who are not coming, um, this will be probably sufficient. So quickly, um, there are many manifestations of tissue liquidity and embryonic development. This is an excised piece of the limb from a chick totally irregular fragment, it runs up, and you could see the video there, it runs up spontaneously, uh, like a liquid drop, acquiring a, a spherical shape. Two such spheres fuse, and uh, the animation uh, is based on, on properties of liquids. And you can see this fusion, um, and, the, and the end result is one ball with a smaller uh, volume with smaller surface than the surface of those two guys. It's, 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 it's even quantitatively, it mimics liquids. And, and we have studies because you see here a 
uh, time sequence, and that allows us to Chris knows this by now uh, uh, by heart. So you can quantify this fusion, and that turns out to be describable by the theory of viscous liquids. These are two identical right tissues. Yes. Yes. Um, now this is amazing. Uh, those are these are two liquids. Two liquid, true liquid drops put together. <clears throat> the white one is oil, this one is water. Now you know that typically it's oil that surrounds water. And you see this sequence of events, and at the end of the day, I hope you can see it, it's the, it's the oil drop engulfing the, the, the water drop. If you look at this image, there are two cell type, two tissues here. This one is, um, is liver. I believe. No, it's pigmented epithelium, and this is neural retina. And neural retina engulfs pigmented epithelium. It started out like that, and uh, I leave it to your fantasy with which, which, which image here you want to compare this. So it's an intermediate stage on the way of neural retina engulfing pigmented epithelium. The end of the day is this, even there. At that, if I, at that point, endothelial cells exclude muscle cells. The endothelium would have gone on the outside. That dry. depends on what is the surrounding. If the surrounding is liquid, then it is true. If the surrounding is collagen, it is not true. Oh. Then it happens the other way around. <laughs> and and that, that is also physics. Um, here is sorting. There are two cell types here, the, the green ones and the red ones. The yellow is just interference. It is a random mixture. In 24 hours, the red ones are outside. The green ones are sorted to the middle. The only difference between the two cell types here, both of them are uh, genetically manipulated Cho cells. Uh, the green ones contain about 25% to 30% more n coherence cell adhesion molecules than the red ones. They are more cohesive, and the more cohesive source to the middle. Happens the same way in liquids. Water is more cohesive than oil. That's why oil surrounds water. And it is manifested in a physical property of liquids that's called surface tension. If you know what it is, fine. If you don't, you still will sleep well. Um, now, this image is due to Chris. And this is, uh, this is an image that I show broadly because this, is, this, this, this underlines almost everything I said before. This is embryonic development. What you see here is a, a differential interference microscopy. You see two little asterisks, and those show uh, the, the cross-section of... Um, of um, of dorsal aorta, two dorsal aorta on the back of the mouse. And with time, so those are two, two tubes forming. With time, you can see, the, you, you, you see the fusion of those two tubes. It's done in a little bit more complicated way, but, but for our discussion, this is probably suffices. And eventually, the two tubes give rise to one, which is the, the descending, the, the, the main descending aorta. That's the way it forms in early development. So essentially, two tubes fuse. I'm using the same thing in our bioprinting uh, 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 game. So here is a true morphogenetic manifestation of a morphogenetic process of tissue fusion. And we're using the same thing. And sorting is also a ubiquitously used morphogenetic process but used by the embryo. That's how you get the segregation, compartment formation, and, and eventually uh, organ formation. So this is what we, are, what we are using. So to wrap up, if those are mimic liquids, then they have to have also properties similar uh, to liquids. And I said that surface tension is one of those properties. So we measure the surface tension of five embryonic chick tissues. Then we mixed the, the, the segregated cells. We let the, the uh, sorting take place. And according to the theory of liquids, 
uh, you take those two, in this case uh, the, the, the red one is neural retina and the inner one is uh, liver, so liver is sorted to the middle. And uh, uh, the theory of liquid says that, that if this were true liquids, this liquid is more cohesive than the other, which means it should have a higher surface tension than the one outside. And if you look at all the five, uh, uh, four panels and the five tissues, you will see that the arrangement is consistent with the measured surface tension. So for example, when you take neural retina and liver, liver has a higher surface tension, 4.6 times per centimeter, and the neural retina has 1.6. And in every case, this, this trend remains. And what is amazing, that when you take indeed neural retina and liver, liver goes inside. But when you take liver and heart, uh, liver goes outside because of the change in the surface tension. And, and this is really uh, due to Malcolm Steinberg's uh, ideas, which, which, is, which is very nicely reproduced. His, his, his ideas about, about how this uh, comes about, how tissues in, in, engulf each other, and I had a good chance to be in his lab and build a, a, a device with which we could measure those surface tensions. Okay, so what's the future? Where is organ printing heading? Well, that would be great, right? We could just build a, a, a heart this way or any other organ. Well, as, as far as I'm concerned, this will never happen. Well, that's the bad news. Although people who, who, who are associated with me on the business side, they say, never say that. Well, and I, I promise that when we talk to venture capitalists, I never say never. But, but you are scientists, so um, I don't want to lie. I don't think this will happen, simply because uh, I mean, a complex organ like that is the result of evolution, million, millions of years. Uh, we're not going to reproduce this in many details by whatever uh, trick, but so this is the bad news. The good news is we don't have to. Because what is a heart? The heart is a pump. Well, it's a complex organ, but the most important property is that it has to supply the blood to the, uh, to the organism. So if we can print, or we can engineer an organ from your own cells, so no immunological reaction from your own cells, something that is functionally equivalent to this one, doesn't necessarily look like this one, that's fine. I don't care what's the shape. I, I do care about the internal ar architecture, but the overall shape, I don't. What I care about is functionality. And I think that we will be able to do. So that's what I think um, this technology is, is going uh, heading to, and this illustrates it very well, what I mean, so one day, you just walk into a specialized clinic, you shed your cells, you say, I want a three-chamber heart or a four-chamber heart, and we'll print you one, um, which is going to be a heart in this sense that I just mentioned to you. Not necessarily the same kind of organ that you carry in your body. So, now that, uh, to finish, um, here, is, here is where I think we, we can go with this technology, and in fact, Organovo is heading in this direction. This number, 65 billion, is the amount of money the pharmaceutical company spends per year today, globally, for drug development. That's huge. What do we get for this 65 billion dollars? This is what we get. The number of drugs in time approved by the FDA peaked in 1996. And last year, well, no, this is now two years, 2010, there were 21 drugs that they approved. They got a little bit better, but still, 21 drugs a year. And we spent $65 billion. Something is utterly wrong here. And in fact, this is what happened. Um, we're getting more sophisticated, more critical. To bring a drug from birth to the market costs roughly $1.5 billion today. That's, that's, that's ridiculously expensive. Why is it expensive? Well, there are many reasons for that, but here is one. You do your wonderful preclinical animal trials in the lab. You're supported by NIH for that, and you're happy. 
And then eventually, of course, you have to go to human clinical trials. Up to 50% of the drugs is eliminated when you go to phase one clinical trials. And by the time you go to phase one clinical trials, you will have spent about 400, 400 million dollars. And then it's out. Now, you, if, if, if your drug fails, it fails, it, it, it's better, it better fails fast. Because if it fails in uh, phase three clinical trials, which is the huge statistical um, study, then, then you, will, you will waste more than a billion dollars. And that's what happened to Pfizer and it's almost closed down. The biggest pharmaceutical company in the world. So, so what can be done? Well, what Organovo is right now doing is that we engineer little pieces of, 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 uh, of, of, of the critical tissue, for example, liver tissue. The pharmaceutical company is coming up with a drug for some kind of liver disease, cirrhosis, whatever. And the animal trials are done on the full organism, but now you, want, you have to go to human clinical trials. So they come to us, well, in fact, we invented this business model, but now what, ha what is happening, they come, they deposit the cells, we sometimes don't even know what the hell those cells are, they give us the culture medium for those cells and they tell us, build us a two by two by half a centimeter structure, three dimensional structure out of those cells. Now we know how to do that, so we have this little tissue construct, maybe 200 of those. And then they take those 200 tissue constructs and they pipe up the drug or they put it in, a, in, a, in an environment where they, they have the drug in there dissolved in different concentrations or in different composition and then they see what happens. So this is good for toxicity, this is good also for efficacy, it's not, it's not perfect. Of course, it's still a, a piece of a liver. Uh, what if, it, if it's okay uh, for this, but it kills you because it's toxic to your heart? True. Well, eventually what we'll do, we will take a piece of heart tissue, this and that, and we'll try the same drug on those. But right now, this is saving, well, that's the idea, that, that this way they will eliminate quickly the ones that don't, don't work. And that actually is the major approach that they are taking. Kill the drug fast and not later. And this is what, this helps enormously. So the, the market value of this approach is estimated to be about, uh, uh, per drug is roughly two to three hundred million dollars. So if they can save this much, this much money, they will love us. Yes, you have a question. Uh, has the FDA uh, began accepting data from, from these uh, three-dimensional engineered tissue for safety and efficacy? Okay. I have no clue, okay. but I don't care. That's the pharmaceutical people. Uh -huh. Let them worry about it. If they come to us and, and, and ask us to make such constructs, they presumably thought of this question. I would like to believe. Actually, I, I'm not 100% sure, but, but probably they are thinking about it. So they, they, they have the animal trials, then they have those trials. Um, in fact, you know, on the second thought, uh, you know, FDA may even not be necessary in this game because if, if the drug fails, which is not on this, at this level, uh, which is not necessarily a proof that it's inefficient, but it's a good indication that it might not, and the pharmaceutical company said, okay, don't, the hell with it. We go back to animal trials and we modify the drug. Then it never gets to the FDA. Oh, I see. Right? That, ma that makes more sense. Yeah. That's, I think that's, that's what they are. It's an internal, internal control. Test, Correct. Not a, not a, right. Uh, right. Right. They will go to the phase one clinical trials if those give good results and this one gives good results. It still may fail for the reasons I just mentioned. But, but this approach is going to be evaluated. So this is basically the end, and of course you uh, you have to thank uh, the people who who, who did the work, the work, and I 
I was fortunate in the last 10 years to be surrounded with excellent students. Uh, some of them uh, uh, went on and work in those companies that, that we, we founded. And uh, we were generously supported by, by grants, uh, which, which I'm phasing out from my life, thanks God, uh, and, and getting money from other sources. And, uh, and the number of collaborators, so it was fun. And uh, this is the f this is how Organo was started. Now it has 32 employees, and uh, it's a public company by now. So uh, that's a good feeling. Thank you. It's a good company. To consider SBIR right? Yeah, well, at Organovo gathered a number of SBIRs in Modern Meadow, as I told you. Got the first one last week. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. We've already asked a lot of questions. I think we'll break right now and go get lunch and come back and pick up with well, questions. Maybe one or two questions. Yes. So if there's anybody who's not going to come back later, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, okay, okay. Let's let's stand. Stand. we'll be here in an hour. Uh, <laughs> Cells from the patient themselves, but earlier in the t and so first, so there's two levels. Are those going to be the, the cells, the actual cells, or those going to be stem cells? But also, my other question was, Mark, when you were talking earlier about you give the the vessel you made to the surgeon, and you said the surgeon is going to ask such and such questions. I thought you were going to say what about about is this is the mouse or rat going to react uh, immunologically to these cells? What are you doing about that in those It's cases? not going to react. It's autologous. It's made of the rat's own cells. Oh, it is. Okay. Well, that's the big, big right. issue. Right. Autologous tissue engineering is the future. I want to give anything to you, even in, the, in this exercise of taking this uh, three-dimensional tissue construct for drug, drug testing, I will make it from your own cells. And so the, the pharmaceutical company is going to test that drug on, 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 on your own contract, not, not Joe's contract. Because it may work for Joe, but it may not work for you. So that's where it is. So you, but you're going to use differentiated cells, not stem cells? Uh, well, for, for building a little liver construct, yeah, I take liver cells from you, yes, and whatever else is needed. How are you getting so many of the rats, smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells with this? Well, that, that's always a, an issue, but for a one centimeter construct, it's not a big deal. You, 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 you take um, uh, uh, cells from even from the, the same rat from somewhere else with biopsy, and then you grow up the cells. Of course, you, can, you always have to be careful because as soon as you, uh, you, you do the biopsy, the cells that are taken out are not the same as the cells that are inside. But that's what we do. You passage the cells uh, until you have sufficient number, and then you make your construct. One centimeter is not a problem. If you have to make a, a much bigger construct, yes, cell source is always a problem. And um, I've been talking to already people here how to, how to get help, how to make uh, a cell culture in a massive scale. For us, this is, this is the challenging question. We are going to resolve that. Yes? How long did you have the constructs in the rats? Okay, so that, that this was a, a time uh, uh, study started three, six, nine, and twelve weeks. So we checked. Um, we had rats with for three weeks. We had to kill the rat, and we looked at and the end. At the end, it was the twelve weeks. So they, they say in twelve weeks, regeneration has to be okay, and um, so that was the longest time that we waited. Maybe there was a study beyond that. But three months is typically what you do. And um, yeah, so that's the answer to your question. Three you months. the histology? Have yes, yes, with it. Yeah, sorry. Have with with the histology, it? yeah. Uh, I think, yes, it's out. I I'll tell you. Just, just came out uh, a few days ago. Okay. Thank you. No, I think there was a question. You, you Part of the issue with vascular conduits, uh, more so than the conduit, is the flow phenomenon from the interface. Conduit with the native vessel. And with the artificials, we tend to get neoantimal hyperplasia. 
or pseudoaneurysm formation. So a lot of the complications and limitations of the current non-biologic is at that interface. Correct. How intensely have you studied the integration of your constructs, the intimal transition from native to construct vessel, and are there problems with that interface? This well, is a surgeon. It, it, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not a surgeon, so I did not study it intensely. Uh, but the surgeons presumably do. So far, they, have, they, they did not come back and complain because of that. Uh, but it is also true that uh, they mostly use glue, not, not suture at this point. And it didn't, it didn't seem to have all caused problems. But uh, you're raising a question that I can throw back to you. If somebody has to go through um, cardiac bypass surgery, and still either from the, the lag or your mesentery artery, you still have to suture it, what happens then? You know, that's the issue. I mean, if, if you're going to change the biology there, we see more than the intimal with the PTFEs and the Daquons, but the phenomenon still occurs. But which leads to my second question to you is that endothelial cell source may be very key. I would absolutely. I would premise that endothelial cells of the vena cava, the saphenous vein, the aortic arch, and the princess polyps artery have different biology. And the cell source of your endothelial thing may need to be site specific for that application, and that's probably part of the biology we're seeing is that you've got a mix, mix match even with autologous venous conduits of the biology that you're mm -hmm. matching it. Yeah. Although Mr. Clinton had a quadruple bypass surgery and is still a happy camper, yeah. so I guess there are people who but most of the, the recent diagnosis rate of that is about 50% at 5 to 10 years, but if I drop a lima down, it's an autologous artery in its natural milieu, if you will, and plug it into the coronary system, it does that. Okay, okay, okay. Well, you, your questions Thank are you to the point. Earlier, right. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> Dose is a reality. It's very important. Important. Thank you. Are we done? I think I think we're done. We're done? And we will re regroup on the other side of the wall at uh, in about forty five minutes.